gentle and of course very modern apes, they found another one. For the love of God, you guys, stop finding hominins. We have too many. I can only handle so much. Biological anthropologists have been eating really well the past several decades. We simply cannot stop pulling up more ancient relatives from the ground. The problem is, with more fossils comes more questions. And today we have a new monkey wrench being thrown into a period of time that is already known for having too many monkey wrenches in it already. It is almost exclusively monkey wrenches. I am of course talking about the Middle Pleistocene, which has been affectionately dubbed in the paleoanthropological community as the muddle in the middle. Now there are many other periods of time that are kind of bugaboos within human evolution. Some of them are because we don't have enough fossils, like how do we identify the oldest hominin after the last common ancestor of hominins and panins? That's going to be about 7 million years ago. There's another deficit right at the beginning of genus Homo, around 2 to 3 million years ago. And then you have the opposite problem, where there are too many hominin fossils and they're difficult to parse out. I think just over 3 million years ago can qualify for this because we have a lot of of Australopiths and which one is sort of the root of genus Homo is a pretty big question, but there are so many species of Australopithecus that it's sometimes difficult to determine who belongs where. Throw Kenyanthropus in there as well and things just become even more complicated. But the classic case of too many fossils has got to be the Middle Pleistocene. The Pleistocene as a geologic period starts about 2.5 million years ago and ends just 12,000 years ago, and it encompasses much of human evolution from the origin of our genus, genus Homo, to like almost present day. The part that is simultaneously super epic and also horribly inconvenient is that we have so many hominin species and they're all pretty variable. So for instance, the Pleistocene is home to not only early members of genus Homo, depending on how you classify them, things like Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis, as well as Homo erectus sensulatus, so this would include sort of archaic looking Homo erectus like Homo georgicus and Homo ergaster, all the way up into the middle and late Pleistocene, where we see familiar faces like Homo heidelbergensis, Homo neanderthalensis, or the Neanderthals, Denisovans, Homo floresiensis, Homo naledi, Homo lusinensis, and of course, Homo sapiens. But genus Homo isn't the only game in town during the Pleistocene as far as hominins go. Paranthropus is walking around, and members of Australopithecus also still roam the earth. By the time the middle Pleistocene rolls around, about one point two million years ago to around 700,000 years ago, that block of time, most hominins that aren't a part of genus Homo have gone extinct. We no longer see things like Australopithecus, and it's probably a safe bet to say that most Paranthropus are also gone. But still roaming the earth are things like Neanderthals, Denisovans, late surviving Homo erectus, and of course Homo sapiens, as well as Homo floresiensis and Homo lusinensis, although those last two aren't going to be a part of our story today. A super basic cladogram for the relationships of the hominins we're talking about today might look a little something like this, with this further outgroup node over here being Homo erectus, followed by Denisovans and Homo neanderthalensis as a sister group that is most closely related to Homo sapiens. Now, our really important relationships are going to be this block right here. Homo sapiens, the last common ancestor of Homo sapiens and this sister group over here, is going to have lived probably around 600,000 years ago. The dates that you tend to hear are 400 to 800, so we'll put a pin in the middle and call it 600,000 years ago. There's some, there's some work that supports that as well. These two separate from one another a little bit more recently in time, probably around 400,000 years ago. So... This node is 600,000 years ago, and this node is 400,000 years ago. This pair of sister groups have a different geographic history as compared to Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens emerges in Africa around 300,000 years ago, whereas Denisovans emerges on the Tibetan Plateau or around the Tibetan Plateau, generally in Asia, uh, around 400,000 years ago. Again, that's when that split occurs. And Homo neanderthalensis, the same, but in Europe, Eurasia, really and truly. Neanderthals are known to have been capable of interbreeding, at least in some directions, maybe unidirectionally, depending on like 
how the hybrid sterility thing ends up hashing out. Uh, and Denisovans could also interbreed with Homo sapiens. In part, we know this because modern humans of specific ancestries still carry certain amounts of Neanderthal DNA or Denisovans DNA. But Neanderthals and Denisovans could also interbreed with one another. And when they did this, it was typically over by where Denisovans could be found in the continent of Asia. Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, and Denisovans all have specific identifiable genomes, and Homo sapiens and Neanderthals also have clockable morphologies, diagnostic characteristics that can identify a given hominin cranium as being from Homo sapiens or Neanderthals. Denisovans is a little bit different because we know it almost exclusively from its genome. There's some mandibular material, a portion of a, of a finger bone, of a phalanx, and we have some teeth from it, but other than that, it's pretty much a mystery, the morphological um, distinguishing characteristics that would have applied to Denisovans as compared to Neanderthals or Homo sapiens, or even late surviving Homo erectus, which was also kicking around Asia at this time. So we have four different hominins roaming Asia from the period of time of like 100,000 years ago to about 500,000 years ago. We know Homo erectus is there, we know Neanderthals are sometimes there, we know Denisovans are there, and we know Homo sapiens is sometimes there. So what if I told you that we found some absolutely incredibly well-preserved fossils whose morphology do not match any of them? These are the enigmatic Asian archaics, and that's a term and a figure that I stole from Chris Stringer's video on the subject. Chris Stringer is a famous paleoanthropologist who focuses, or at least as of late, has been focusing on this region and sort of the, the late hominins that are living there. Dr. Stringer was on the Harbin Skull paper, which is a description of a different enigmatic cranium coming from the same region that also doesn't match the morphology, as we understand it, for Homo sapiens, late surviving Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalensis, or what we know about from Denisovans. Now, the Harbin Skull is an interesting case because one of the other publications sort of on it, separate from the one Chris was on, but still involving most of the same team, it got its own new species name as this thing that is distinct from all of the other hominins living in the area at that time, and it was dubbed Homo longi, or the Dragon Man. Now, the fact that that is absolutely super cool aside, that's an epic name, Christianer wasn't on that paper because he felt that we should follow typical nomenclature rules. And because the Harbin skull is probably in the same group as the rest of these enigmatic Asian archaics that are not Homo sapiens, to be clear, he felt that we should go with one of the earlier nomenclatures assigned to one of those previous skulls, the Dolly skull in particular, and thus that would make Harbin and all of those skulls fitting into that Harbin group uh, Homo daliensis. We're going to discuss the Harbin skull more in a moment because some of what we dealt with with the Harbin skull also applies to this new cranium. So in East Asia, and I'm including Indonesia in that group, at this time period, which is, let's just call it 150,000 years ago, so after the Middle Pleistocene, we have at least six, probably seven hominid species alive and ecking out a living at different points during the year. So we have Homo sapiens, Homo neanderthalensis, Denisovans, late surviving Homo erectus, Homo floresiensis, Homo lucinensis, and probably this enigmatic East Asian archaic group, which Chris Stringer typically calls the Harbin group. Now I know what you're thinking, because it's what I was thinking basically up until very recently. Why are we classifying a lot of these enigmatic uh, East Asian archaics as their own thing instead of just calling them Denisovans? Because we have Denisovans DNA, we know Denisovans was living here, and yet we have like a dearth of Denisovans remains. How do we know that these guys aren't just actually Denisovans? And we're going to get to that in a minute. First, we need to meet our new hominin. This is HLD6, the Hua Longdong skull from China. The HLD6 specimen is composed of a partial cranium and a nearly complete mandible that together date to approximately 300,000 years ago in Hua Longdong, East China. The specimen belonged to a juvenile, but even taking that into consideration, it's an odd combination of features. 
In paleoanthropology, features are usually examined on a sort of sliding scale of being more basal, that is to say they look more primitive, or being more derived, closer to the modern condition. When you have a mix of these features in a single structure, like say the mandible, which is what we're going to be looking at today with HLD6, it's called a mosaic. These odd features of the Hua Longdong specimen were compared to 83 other specimens in a geometric morphometric analysis. Geometric morphometrics, or GM, is a type of analysis that takes 3D structures, like for instance, a mandible, and quantifies the differences between multiple specimens using homologous landmarks. So some quick anatomy before we get into the geometric morphometrics of the mandible here so you can understand why this specimen is so weird. I'm going to make it really simple, don't worry. We have a mandible. This is the corpus, this portion of the jawbone, like the body. And that's literally what corpus means, is body. So this portion is the corpus. The mandibular symphysis is this portion in the front, basically where your chin is. And the ramus is this sort of hinge portion back here. Okay, so we're gonna look at figure seven here because this nicely lays out the results of their geometric morphometric analysis. Uh, these are a bunch of box and whisker plots. You can find this figure just with a Google image search. So I think I should be good fair use wise, even though this paper is not open access, which by the way, why we're not going through it line by line. Uh, so this is a breakdown of different features of the mandible. The symphysial angle is A, the symphysial robusticity index, or SRI, is B, corpus robusticity index, specifically at the first molar, is C, and the ramus breadth is at D. So we're going to see where HLD6, which is the far left dash in each of these box and whisker plots, where it falls out as compared to the early, middle, late Pleistocene um, hominins, Neanderthals, and recent modern humans. So this is, a, again, a box and whisper, whisker plot, excuse me. So the medians are gonna be where our dashed line is. That dark dashed line is not an average, but a median. Um, and then the horizontal lines within the boxes, so here and here, represent 25% of the cases, and the whiskers, so that's these lines extending out from the box, are going to contain 75% of cases around the median. So. HLD6 in the symphysial angle, so that's like, again, right where the chin is in modern humans, is like well outside modern humans. Most of these hominins are, because humans, modern humans, are the only ones with like a real bona fide chin. So it's pretty primitive in that aspect. In the symphysial robusticity index, we see that everything is tracking much more together. Recent modern humans and HLD6 are pretty close together, but at the same time, so are Neanderthals, the late Pleistocene and the middle Pleistocene. Hominin. So this isn't really saying much. In the corpus robusticity index at the M1, so the robusticity of the body of the mandible at the first molar, we see that HLD6 is primitive compared to like most of the medians for the other hominins looked at, despite the fact that this is a 300,000 year old hominin. So it is presenting a very basal morphology compared to things that are quite a bit older than it, which is kind of weird, especially compared to the minimum ramus breadth. So the minimum, the ramus, remember, is this portion right up here after the uh, mandibular angle where your, your jaw kind of curls up, up towards the joint. And you can see that it's tracking well derived compared to the early Pleistocene, middle Pleistocene, and right around where the late Pleistocene hominins are tracking um, about on the level of Neanderthals. So this specimen has a lot of really primitive and a lot of really modern characteristics mixed together in a single mandible. Now you might be thinking, why so much focus on the mandible instead of the cranium, guts it given? Like, why are we looking at this mandible instead of the, the arguably much cooler portion of the skull, which is the, the face, the cranium of this thing? And the reason is really interesting and has a lot of implications for like, the evolution of hominins in East Asia and where we're at at the middle and late Pleistocene with regard to hominin diversity there. Okay, so let me explain, right? In this area at this time, we know exactly what Neanderthals look like. We have Neanderthal crania and we have Neanderthal mandibles. So we have the full skull for Neanderthals, check. Same thing for Homo sapiens. We know what Homo sapiens looks like in this area at this time. We have the, the crania for them and we have the mandibles. So full skulls for Homo sapiens, great. Same situation for Homo erectus. But when we look at Denisovans, what do we have? We have, again, a portion of a finger bone, some teeth, and a partial mandible, the Jiahi mandible. 
So this little thing is the Jiahi mandible, and it has been ascribed to belonging to Denise Evans on the basis of not morphology, because remember, we don't have anything from Denise Evans. It's mostly known from its genetics. It's been ascribed to Denise Evans on the basis of protein work. So proteomics has, and I think this is done a pretty good job making the case, right? Like this has been assigned to Denise Evans on the basis of proteins pulled from the specimen itself. So Jahi, let's just say that this thing is Denisovans. Now, this thing has been linked to this thing, the Harbin skull. The Harbin skull, remember, is sort of one of our enigmatic East Asian archaics, as Chris Stringer puts it, something that isn't Denisovans, isn't Homo sapiens, isn't Neanderthals, and isn't late surviving Homo erectus. Harbin is a great example of one of those. And Harbin, which has traditionally clumped with a lot of those other East Asian archaics like Dali, it's like been softly linked with the Jiahi mandible, which is the basis that most people use to say that Harbin and by association all of those other members of the East Asian archaics are actually Denisovans. But do you see a problem here? This is a cranium. Jiahi is a mandible. The way that they're linked, at least as far as I understand it, is mostly on the basis of the molar, because there is one preserved tooth in Harbin, even though you can't see it here, it's actually a molar. That's how they link the two together. However, HLD6 changes the story, because for HLD6, we have a cranium and a mandible, so it can be compared to both Harbin and the Jiahi mandible. And what we found is that this thing has a lot of similarities with Harbin and not a lot with the Jiahi mandible, which means if this thing isn't Denise Evans, and the paper that just got published that we looked at makes a pretty decent case on the basis of GM that it is not Denise Evans, or at least it's not Denise Evans if Jiahi is Denise Evans, what that would suggest then is that the Harbin group is in fact a distinct group of hominins with their own distinct morphologies to the exclusion of Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, late surviving Homo erectus, and Denisovans. Now obviously there's a lot of questions that come after this proposal, right? How do we know that the Harbin group isn't just the result of a lot of different interbreeding and hybridization between the hominins that are already there? And the answer is we, we don't, we don't really know that, although I think it would probably be unlikely to be the case since there's such a consistent morphology that seems to group this enigmatic East Archaic cluster together. Another question might be, how do we know that HLD6 and Harbin and Dali and the others aren't just Denisovans and that it's just a highly variable group? Because obviously there is a case to be made that there's some connection between Jiahi, Harbin, and by extension HLD6 and the others, because Harbin and Jiahi fell out as grouped together in Chris Stringer's initial work on the Harbin skull. But as he points out himself, that's mostly on the basis of that second molar, which is a primitive characteristic, so it can't necessarily be used to, to link the two. What if Jiahi isn't actually Denisovans? It was only described as Denisovans on the basis of that proteomic work, and that work is described in some cases as slender support. So maybe Jiahi isn't actually Denisovans, and then that would mean that Jiahi, Harbin, and HLD6 could all be Denisovans, and maybe some of the others that have traditionally clumped into the East Asian Archaic group are maybe another species or the result of hybridization. A lot of the confusion here comes from the fact that we have a lot of Denisovans DNA and not a lot is known about its morphology, and we have a lot of morphology from this Harbin group and no DNA. If we could fill in some of the blanks on either of those columns, we might move forward in understanding like how these specimens hash out into either one highly diverse group or two separate groups that can be designated as different species, or maybe some combination of the two with some hybridization involved as well with the Neanderthals, late surviving Homo erectus and Homo sapiens that are living in the area. There's just a lot of different possibilities here. Chris Stringer has suggested maybe we've got a trichotomy going on. Maybe there's the last common ancestor of Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, and some enigmatic third group, and 
all three of them kind of split out at the same time from this last common ancestor, almost like the end of a trident, right? Like a trichotomy. And then there's a lot of interbreeding and gene flow between Neanderthals and this middle group, the Harbin slash Denisovans group, and also Homo sapiens and that middle group. And that's what's giving the illusion that Neanderthals are more closely related to Denisovans and Homo sapiens is potentially more closely related to this Harbin group. It's just a big old mystery at present. Luckily, big old mysteries are what make paleoanthropology and biological anthropology super interesting. Case in point, I'm not normally that fascinated, comparatively speaking, in the late and middle Pleistocene as compared to much earlier time periods when hominins are more apish in general. Like once things start to look too human, I'm kind of like, eh. I, I prefer the, the, the border between what we would recognize as like starting to become human and earlier apes. That's why I like the Maya scene so much. But this has got me in a tizzy. What the heck is going on here? And indeed, it just goes to show how many different ways there were to be human in just the very recent past. And so my gentle and of course very modern apes, I'll keep you updated on this stuff. If you like what I do, you can support me in a free way by liking, commenting, and subscribing. Or you can join my Patreon if you want to like pay to support me and you get your name at the end in a little shout out and sometimes on rare occasions, they get early access to videos. So, my gentle modern apes, I'll see you in the next one.